Welcome to the Baxter Riches Podcast. I'm Zach Ginn, your host. I quit my minimum wage bag boy job to pursue the riches of real estate investing at the age of 17 and never looked back. I'm here to educate and inform entrepreneurs, young and old, how to become complete real estate investors by talking to the best and most influential minds in real estate. I'm joined today by our guest, the flippin' nerd himself, Mike Hambright. Mike is a real estate investor, speaker, coach, creator of the Investor Fuel Mastermind, one of the biggest masterminds in real estate investing. And he also built a huge real estate flipping business doing over 400 deals. And now he is on a journey to focus and help mentor others in real estate investing. Thanks for coming on, Mike. Yeah, hey, Zach. Great. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, sweet. So uh, let's get the cliche thing out of the way. Let's talk about how you went from the finance and the corporate America world all the way into real estate investing. Yeah, yeah. So it was uh, kind of 2007 is when I left my uh, corporate job, I guess, for the last time. So the first time uh, before that, a few years before that, I had worked for a large multi-billion dollar company that everybody would know that actually doesn't even exist anymore, but had about uh, 35,000 employees while I was there. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I had spent a lot of my life getting educated. I was the first person in my family to go to college even, but had spent a lot of time getting educated, even going to grad school and all that too. You know, when I look back now, I was constantly trying to improve myself so that somebody would want me effectively, which is like what the corporate America game is all about, right? It's like, how can I give myself the best resume uh, to get hired by the next person? How can I work hard enough so I can get promoted or earn a little bit of a raise or whatever? So I was kind of caught up in that rat race for a while. And then one day, totally unexpectedly out of nowhere, uh, got fired from my job and it was largely, it was just internal politics stuff. It was because my boss had gotten fired and I was his outspoken right-hand man. And uh, essentially, you know, that's just what happened, Ca kind of caught off guard. And when you're in the corporate world, you know, recovering from that is is difficult sometimes. So I um, ended up going to another a company after, you know, several months of looking for the right job and uh, worked there for 18 months. We were flying high and then even though the top line of the company was doing well, the bottom line wasn't. So this company, you know, uh, I will say kind of out of nowhere. I mean, not out of nowhere, but it was a bit of a shock to me because I just wasn't paying attention to that much, um, filed for bankruptcy. And, uh, you know, the company ended up staying around for a couple of years, but they're gone now too. But the writing was kind of on the wall, like the heydays are over, right? And, and uh, the good paying days are over with now. And now we got to button up on expenses. And so kind of going through a couple of experiences like that just kind of made me realize that, I have to take my financial future into my own hands. And uh, so that, that brings us to kind of 2008, early part of 2008, where I said, hey, I need to just, uh, I need to do my own thing and started fishing around. I'd always been interested in real estate investing. And the short version of that story is I started in real estate investing. Of course, there's a much longer version of that story. Oh, there, there's, I've, I've heard it before. <laughs> there, there's a million interviews where he talks about, he's got his own podcast here where he can talk about it. So yeah. yeah, we'll keep that short and sweet, but yeah, fast yeah. forward, you've done a lot of deals. You're helping so many people now. Uh, is it too much to say that that Investor Fuel Mastermind is probably one of the biggest masterminds in all real estate investing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's grown pretty fast too. We, we've mm -hmm. only been operating for two and a half years and uh, we've wow. got a great group. In fact, I literally just got off of a, another webinar, webinar we do uh, with our group uh, to share we just taught, we had a, a guy that's, you know, owned several hundred uh, units talking about scaling your rental business. It's just, uh, so yeah, it's a great, it's a great group for sure. All right, great. So uh, starting out in real estate investing, obviously you didn't know it all starting out, even though you had no. all the accolades. I mean, how did you know about real estate? Like, how did you get started? Who was your mentor? Yeah. You know, when I first started, I, I didn't really, I didn't have one. I honestly, I was just, that's part of the problem. Part of the lessons that I've learned from that I now uh, try to teach in others and still in others is to learn from others. Yeah. The importance of your network. I mean, if anybody that knows me, they know like everything I do is network based and community based because I know when you get around a lot of other people doing what you're doing or, or that are smarter than you, then it, it helps you. Right. So I didn't have anybody for a while. Honestly, I was trying to look at the MLS and find deals and work with agents that were clueless in, in hindsight and just didn't really know what to do. And then I, I actually had a mentor in my life that was right under my nose the whole time. It was a guy, he actually was uh, an accountant for my family's uh, uh, 
my father-in-law actually used him as an accountant. He was our accountant actually before I was even a real estate. I knew he was a real estate guy, but I didn't know anything about him. Well, this guy owned an accounting practice, but he also had a couple thousand uh, uh, rental properties because oh. he was a smart accountant. I mean, he knew how to, he knew how to minimize his tax bill through real estate. And so, um, you know, once I decided to get into real estate and started talking to him and a few other people, you know, I just kind of pieced it together a little bit of knowledge here and there. But uh, I know a lot more now about how to seek out mentors and how to go find people that have the knowledge that I need or that I want to know more of. But uh, it, it was a longer road for me because I had to kind of piece it together, right? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the, another reason why I want you on here besides you, you're a great mentor, you got a lot of knowledge, you have experience, I would say is you're not like a flashy guru. Like you make a lot of money, but you don't flash it out like you're not wearing gucci everything you're not going crazy on all these toys i mean you're <laughs> you are as humble as they come why making great money and i really appreciate that yeah yeah i don't know what to say about that but yeah i'm not you know i'm just uh for me it's <laughs> it's not about well, i was talking to somebody else about it earlier today it's not about money it's about uh, i mean everything i do i want to make a lot of money don't, don't get me wrong but it's not for the money anymore that's just the scorecard to say am i doing well you know it's more like internal ego, but I don't, I mean, we have a nice house. We have a nice cars. We take a lot of vacations. I usually fly Southwest everywhere. Cause I don't really care about being, you know, <laughs> anything other than that. I'm frugal. I was, I grew up poor. So I'm just like, I have this kind of frugal uh, upbringing, you know, so don't get me wrong. I like nice things, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm never, my wife's never gonna let me have a Lambo and I wouldn't want one. <laughs> I, I would love to drive one for a couple of days, but I don't really want to own one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the more impressive thing is uh, having multifamily properties and a great real estate portfolio, in my opinion. The but truth is, is honestly, most of the successful real estate investors out there, probably people you've had on your show before, they would rather take their money and reinvest it back in the business, right? Like yep. I don't need to fly. I don't need to do ex super extravagant things that are wasteful. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what people want. But at the end of the day, I think the, the average kind of successful real estate person, they know the value of leverage and putting that money back in to lever it into the next deal or the next investment, right? Definitely, definitely. And, you know, what do you have to say to some of your young guys? I know your investor fuel mastermind is really driven on, if you got an ego in the room, we're, this is not the place for you. We're here to learn and do better. Right. So, yeah. We were, I, so we were just talking about that. I've, I've got this friend of mine that's an investor fuel member has owned hundreds and hundreds of units as rentals. He's actually been selling some of them off here lately, but he's like, you know, he made some comment to, could I, somebody else that a lot of us know that's out there, that's a big multifamily person. Could I have been that person? Like if I played my cards differently, could I have been like that guy? And it's like, well, that guy's probably thinking, could I have been like the guy ahead of him? And you know, no matter who you are, there's always somebody ahead of you. And if you get caught up on being like somebody else, you're just never going to be happy. So like at the end of the day, I think um, it's one thing to aspire to do more, but you just have to, as you, especially as you get older and you start to have a family and you start to realize like, hey, I have capacity issues or what are my limitations? You know, you start to set your goals. I, I think it's real easy in this industry to see some of the flashy guys out there. I say guys, most of them are guys, the flashier ones. There's a lot of successful women too. But to look at them and say, I want to be like them. But the truth is, is, I can promise you, I know some of those people, like some of those people don't want to be them. <laughs> so it's just this persona that they put on and now they have this ruse they have to keep up. And uh, you know, you just have to be yourself. You have to think about what's important to me, what's important to my family, what's important, what are my goals in life and how do I get there? Doesn't mean you shouldn't be aspirational, but don't be like self-defeating that you're not as big as somebody else out there because you're never gonna be, you're never gonna, if, if that's the path you're on, you're never gonna be happy with yourself. Definitely, definitely. I want to also bring this up too. I'm not a member's mastermind. I don't know what goes on there, but I know from other people <laughs> talking that that's what they say. Uh, so probably the best advice I've heard about masterminds in real estate is you never want to be the smartest guy in the room. Yeah. So I, I really, really like that. You know, that's something I think my listeners should be listening to. So um, another thing I want to clarify too is when they associate Mike Hambright, they see two things. They see investor fuel and flip nerd. Can you Tell me the difference between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Flip nerd uh, is where it all kind of started. I, I guess my online presence, he started with a podcast six and a half years ago. So it was the flip nerd podcast. And from uh, that podcast, um, 
has come other things, right? So as, as I've kind of grown as an investor, as a person, um, as a business over time, it was like, well, what are, what am, what do I offer? So I have coaching program. I've had coaching. I've been coaching for like 11 years. So I have coaching things inside of there. And, uh, then it evolved into how do I surround myself with other high achieving people? I've been a part of other masterminds in the past and it just was a natural fit for me. I've, I've always been a networker. I've always been a connector. I've always like put people together and gotten a lot of value out of helping people get value from one another, if that makes sense. So it just kind of made sense to start a, a mastermind, which is effectively ultimately a high level association of accomplished real estate investors. And we actually have a couple groups based on the level of experience, but everybody in there is an experienced person that's doing deals every month. Some of them are doing hundreds of deals a year. I have done thousands of deals, but we have a couple different groups, but yeah, so it just kind of made sense. Like through my network, through my podcast, through a lot of the relationships that I built, I built up a lot of friendships and it was like, well, let's get together and talk about stuff. And it, the formal kind of structure of that ended up being a mastermind uh, where we get together. So effectively, you know, that's always a question of like, well, how does investor fuel com connect with Flipnerd? What is that? And it's like, well, just kind of imagine Flipnerd is, is the overall umbrella and inside of it, I have coaching, I have the mastermind and we have another, uh, uh, lead generation service now called the investor machine. And so there's a few things that kind of happen inside of there, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that makes total sense. So uh, another thing I really wanted to uh, talk to you about is especially when it comes to real estate investing, uh, were you a wholesaler starting out? Were you a fix and flipper or a wholesale? I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, when I first started, I'll say this, I wanted to just fix and flip. Cause I really didn't even know what wholesaling was like early on. And then I realized, then I realized the power of, you know, this is a cash intensive business. So if you're spending money on advertising, spending money on rehabs, rehabs take, you know, a long time to get done. And mm -hmm. it's like, how do we get, how do we kind of feed the monster? How do we get money in here to keep this whole thing running? And that was wholesaling. And so it took time and it's evolved over the years. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely, I would say for the first five or so years in the business, um, we probably rehabbed about 70% and wholesaled about 30% roughly, kept some as rentals as well. And then about for the, for the rest of the term, honestly, we've been probably 90% wholesale yep. and uh, no assignments, almost no assignments. And I just found that once I had access to capital, I could make more money by throwing it on the MLS and having some somebody else pay more than a traditional wholesale buyer would. So that's kind of how it's evolved, but it took lessons learned. It took having enough cash to set aside to where I'm not living, you know, paycheck to paycheck worried about, I got to wholesale this cause I need money like today and um, having access to investment capital to be able to, you know, close on deals quickly. Exactly. That, that's the way that we do our business now. You know, we started out all wholesale, 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 wholesale. We made money in wholesaling. Right. And we figure out wholesaling was the way. So uh, we're about 90, 10 now, really tight deals. We're not going to wholesale it. Uh, we're actually just going to wholesale that one. So another question I had to tell you because you have some experience here. What would you say your highest highs and your lowest lows have been in the industry? Highest highs. Uh, that's a really good question. You should have given me that in advance. <laughs> think about oh. it. Oh, no, well, I mean, obviously it's in the future. Yeah. But, no, I think uh, highest highs, honestly, I think it was this realization that it probably, they're probably kind of tied together, actually. Mm. I think I, there was a point where I was doing some coaching stuff, but I was still like doing high volume on the real estate side. And this realization that's out there sometimes that, um, you know, co real coaches, actually, I should say there's a lot of people that do coaching that give, there's, there's some people that give coaching a bad name, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, if you can't do it, then you teach or whatever. Like, I think that's actually kind of bullshit. I mean, there are some people that teach that have never really done it. They haven't flipped hundreds of houses. They might've only done a couple. And now all of a sudden they're like selling coaching programs, which is crazy. Those are the ones that give us a bad name. But I think it was this realization of like, I'm kind of tired of the transactional nature of just doing deals myself. I really enjoy helping other people. And this kind of struggle of, does that make me a bad person? person or a fake or something like that. And so, you know, honestly, I really get the most joy out of helping other people. I love doing deals with people, 
it just makes it more fun. And so even some of the coaching stuff that I do now, I try to do it in collaboration with other people because it just makes it more fun. If it's just me in my office or at home or whatever, thinking about it and making decisions, it gets a little monotonous, right? But if you can uh, share in that joy with other people that want that, that like the same thing, um, that's where I get a lot of value. So, you know, have there been some bad times? I think really early on, there were some big struggles as to does this work, right? I mean, there were probably some of the biggest lows were in that time of trying to get going, questioning, does this really work? Um, you know, having struggles with uh, cash flow early on, probably some low points there. But I think, you know, I've thought about this a little bit lately. Like I used to take pride in working. I'm like, I can work harder than anybody else. Yeah. You know, Gary Vee talks about working your face off and all that stuff. And I've kind of talked about it on the show over the past year. Like it's not, there's not, there's no badge of honor for the hustle is kind of one of the things I say, but you, there's nothing wrong with working hard after you get to that, but the goal isn't to work hard. And so I've kind of started to think lately that, Hey, my, I don't, I don't have pride in working hard, but I do have pride in never giving up. Like I'll pivot for as long as I have to, to figure something out. Or, you know, you, at some point you should just cut your losses if it's really not good. But if there's something I really want, it's not that, you know, I work harder than it for than anybody else. Cause I still believe I work hard, but it's like, I'll just keep pivoting and finding a way to make it work yeah. until it's done. And so for anybody that's listening right now, I think that is an important thing for you to do too. If you want this bad enough, don't find some excuse to give up quickly because it does work. It's worked for lots of people and it's worked for a lot of people that are not, you know, geniuses necessarily. I'm not trying to offend anybody here, but truthfully the winners in this are the ones that can, that can hold out the longest until they crack the code and make it work. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, I, when I started out when I was 17, you know, I made, I got three deals made over six figures. I still didn't believe it. I did like, there's still no way this is possible. Eventually I get more deals, more deals and now I'm at now. And I'm like, this works. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's guys, they, they get the first deal in two weeks and other guys, it takes them a year to get it. Uh, but eventually when they crack that code and they figure it out, you know, it becomes a real business. So, right. Uh, the next question I really had for you here uh, was when it comes to your entire business now, are you more focused on, especially you're doing mentoring, coaching now, but on the real right. estate side, are you focusing on getting rentals, multifamily, things like that? Yeah. So I have a, I have a single family portfolio that uh, mm -hmm. we've been um, uh, growing for a while. We haven't really added a lot to that over the past few years because the pro prices have just been so high, but we've been paying down a lot of debt on that. It's accumulated uh, a lot of equity. Um, really over the past year and a half, I've been focused on uh, growing multifamily. So I've been an investor, a general partner in uh, three really big deals, 10 to $15 million deals. Wow. And so, um, you know, that's my primary focus on the investing side is more multifamily stuff at this point. All right, great. So in your team, you obviously have a really great team. I've talked to them trying to set this up, podcast up, you know, uh, when it comes to someone in a wholesaling, trying to scale it or someone, you know, in your team that got employees, what are your core values for yourself and your employees? Yeah, our core values really center around um, personal responsibility, around hard work, around giving. So I've, you know, I've, I've seen firsthand, the more I give, the more I share with people, the more I get in return and the more mm -hmm. kind of good value you put out there. So for the most part, it all centers around hard work, dedication, loyalty, um, and uh, being, being a giver. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, uh, have you ever tried to scale before? I mean, do you, you have acquisitions people and things like that when you're ramping up your wholesaling business? Have I tried to scale? Yeah. So, at our peak, we were, you know, for the most part, we we had a couple of acquisitions people at any given time. Uh, in the beginning, it was just me doing it, right? And so, mm -hmm. and then um, it got to a point over the last few years where a lot of my deals are coming through students. So they're doing the acquisitions role and we're partnering in unique ways and kind of doing JVs on stuff. So that allowed me to scale more cause I didn't have to, you know, they have their own businesses too, or they have other things going on. And so if that makes sense, yeah, the, at the peak, I would say we had two in-house acquisitions, people two two in-house admins and some VAs. Um, and that's been a bunch of evolutions of that one way or another over the years. Definitely. Definitely. And when you started, you sort of started when the market, hit a bottom and it's starting to ramp up, you know, during that time was almost just a perfect uh, unicorn time to get short sales and creative financing. Uh, have you done that, those deals starting out? 
That's interesting. So yeah, we started in 2008 and the truth is, is everybody thought we were crazy for getting started. I won't say that we planned it. I say, when I say we is my wife and I, my wife and I have been in the business. She actually just walked out the door here to pick up our son from school. So we've been tied at the hip for, you know, 12 years now. So we didn't know we were, you know, well educated, if you will, but we were kind of naive to the market, what was going on in the marketplace. So we just honestly got lucky in many ways. We didn't plan it that way. It was just timing of everything else going on in our lives, 2000, 2008. So, um, but it brought, it had unique challenges as well. Like capital was dried up. Uh, I really never bought many. We, I've never, I've literally never bought an REO or never done a short sale, any of those things. And so it's not that the deals weren't out there. It's just not the approach that I had. Mm. So when I look back, should we have been, been doing more? And by the way, we haven't done a lot of creative finance deals, a lot of, a few, a handful of sub twos. I've seller finance. I have a bunch of notes now from houses we've seller finance, but not a ton. So when I look back at that last cycle, should we have done more then? I wish we had. Right. And when I look at the market cycle now, that's a lot of what I'm teaching. Um, people now, or we talk a lot about now, whether it's an investor fuel or my coaching programs is how to take advantage of the fact there's a whole bunch of like three and 4% interest loans out there. So as the market starts to cycle, when that's going to be, I don't know, but I know it's, there's some things starting to happen now. Are there some opportunities to use creative finance to effectively be the bank and do deals you couldn't otherwise do with like a cash transaction? Absolutely. So I think that's, you know, it's one of those things that just, took living through that cycle and saying, knowing what I know now, that's how I would do it differently. Knowing what I know now, that's how I will do it in the next cycle. Great. And I know you're talking before about working hard versus working smart. You know, I, I think that's something very important. I mean, when do you tell your students that they should stop, you know, sticking bandit signs out, doing the sweat equity and just start, you know, getting better revenue generating a marketing channel? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because in my, in my coaching programs, I, I've never, I've literally never used bandit signs and I, oh, really? I don't talk to people about using bandit signs because I've never done it. I, I, you know, it's, it's, I have a couple things to say that are kind of cliche or funny. I'm like, well, if you have to do it under the cover of night and it has the word bandit in it, like it's not a sustainable <laughs> business practice. With that said, I do believe you got to do what you got to do to get started if that's what it takes. So, you know, for the most part, my business is always built on an early understanding that you have to advertise to generate leads consistently. I don't want to have to go out and do activities, put beta signs in and stuff like that mm -hmm. to make the phone ring. And so I need to be able to spend money to make the phone ring. Otherwise, I'm the bottleneck on everything. Like if I want to travel or I'm out sick or something like that, then my business stops. That's not a business. That's 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 a job, you know. So I don't teach those things actually. Now, I will say that that causes problems because a lot of people that um want to get started in real estate, you know, sometimes they're like, well, I I don't have money to advertise and so it's not that there aren't other ways out there. It's just I've always taught from the beginning, here's how to build an actual business with systems and processes and and a sales and marketing funnel. Wow. Great. Yeah. So I started out in bandit signs. Unfortunately, I've had to stop uh, our best county for our market. So I, in my high day in high school, I was putting out 200 bandit signs a month. I was hiring people to do it. And eventually I was the only guy doing bandit signs. So I was making a killing. Um, eventually the county code enforcement, they yeah. hired five people and they, they put me on a whitelist and I can't do it anymore. And yeah. I had a shift to direct mail and other things that work really well. So yeah. Um, I definitely do agree. It's not sustainable. Um, Even now there's uh, you know, there's R RVMs are obviously in trouble. You're, you're in Florida, right? So RVMs yeah. are illegal there. So, you know, and it's just a matter of time before some of those things have more and more pressure. Text message marketing is hot right now. Nothing wrong with it in most States, but it's just a matter of time before there's, there's some laws that go in place against that. And so probably, right. There's pressure on it for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, I think uh, the good thing about mail, which we still focus heavily on mail, um, is that the government's not going to make, you know, junk mail illegal because the government it gets makes money, they get, make, they get paid to deliver it to you. So it's safe. Um, you know, it could be cluttered sometimes, but it's no more cluttered than text message marketing is right now, honestly. No, de definitely. I totally agree with that. So uh, my next question here I had to ask you is what is your deal breaker when it comes to hiring an acquisitions person? What is the one thing if they do this, I, I can't hire you? Uh, that's a good question. I, I would say, you know, 
if I could kind of look back and say, we, we talked a little bit about our core values. I actually have it published out here in our lobby, like on the wall, like what our core values are now. That's relatively new. That's, that's happened in the okay. past two years. It's not that I didn't have core values. They just weren't def like, I didn't have them on the wall mm. you now. And um, so when I look back, I was often looking for hardworking. Will they hustle? Can they weather the storm to get, to get deals in the funnel so they're getting paid? Um, I looked more at things like that. Do I like this person? Are they pleasant? Um, you know, early on, I would say, really honestly, for a long time, that's kind of how I hired is, do I like this person? Would I want to work with them? Mm -hmm. What are the references like? What's their background? Now I care more about those core values. Um, and we usually kind of ask questions to try to find the right people. When I look back now, there's a lot of people that I've fired over the years. And when I kind of run them through the lens of, do they have these core values? They usually didn't, right? And they were maybe self-centered or selfish. They didn't care about other people, things like that. But in terms of a deal breaker, um, you know, at the end of the day, I, I'd say, aside from just like, does it feel, does this feel right? I would say I really am looking for people that have um, direct to consumer kind of high ticket consultative um, sales uh, background in the past, car sales, siding sales, windows, like high, higher ticket items, roofing, things like that, that are, you know, they're not afraid to go knock on a door and talk to somebody. Yeah. And so I just, I want to see that hustle. If they, they don't have that hustle in the background and they're not hungry, then they're probably not a fit. Definitely, definitely. So one of our struggles, I've talked to so many guys trying to scale up. And if they, they've told me before, if their acquisitions guy doesn't match this Colby index, I can't hire them and X, yeah. Y, and Z. I'm just trying to see people's opinions with it. You know, we've had struggles in the past with acquisitions people that seriously didn't believe that someone would sell a house for 40, 50 cents on the dollar. Right. And that was a big struggle for us. So another question I want to ask you is what gets you pumped up every day to get up in the morning out of bed and start the day? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think about this stuff. I, I, I may or may not be going through a midlife crisis right now. I don't know, but <laughs> not kidding. Uh, but you know, I think about this a lot. I'm at a point now, I'm not saying this from a place of ego or anything, but I don't have to do anything that I don't want to do anymore. And um, there are some things that I like to do and I try to focus on trimming the things that I don't like to do. So what really gets me jazzed is just feeling like I'm making an impact in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Like you said, a big part of my, of my uh, business now is uh, services to other real estate investors, whether it's coaching or the mastermind or uh, the lead generation product we have, the investor machine. Um, so I really, you know, like to hear and want to hear that we're changing people's lives one way or another. If it's buying and selling houses, I, I love knowing that we're helping other people and solving their problems as well. So I think that's a big part of it for me is like, again, the P&L is critical, no doubt. But uh, there's another measuring stick and that is kind of impact. And so that's really what gets me going is how can I, I'm on this continual uh, search for how do I take my game to another level by impacting others at a higher level. Okay. And I, I know you started before, so you, you were doing all these deals in Dallas. Are you in Dallas now or are you in yeah. Illinois? No, I grew up in Illinois, but I haven't lived in, in Illinois since 1999, a long time ago now, 21 years ago, moved from Chicago to Dallas. And so almost all of my single family real estate investing, almost all of it has been in, almost all of it's in Dallas, some other stuff outside of, uh, outside of uh, DFW, but in Texas. The multifamily stuff is all over the place. None of it's actually in Texas, but those are much bigger deals. So, uh, yeah, all my single, all my single family stuffs here in DFW. Okay, I was asking because I know they made wholesaling illegal in Illinois, and I thought it was something uh, pretty oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting for sure. But Illinois is a weird state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so another thing I have to ask: you're the first. I, I won't call you a guru, but coach or mentor that I've seen that's helped a lot of people out actually with an MBA. Um, I was uh, saying, has that education experience at all helped you in real estate investing, you think? You know, it's interesting. Um, I could say that I'm not using any of it directly, but does it help mm -hmm. with like critical thinking? I probably, yeah. So um, I met my wife in grad school, so I don't have any regrets. It was a good thing. But you know, it was, it really, if you look back, it's easy to say, should I have done things differently or could I have? Of course you could have. But when you look back and you see somehow these things got me all to where I am now. 
It's hard to put a finger on it and say, this class really helped me. I do have this general belief um, that formal education has a lot of shortfalls mm -hmm. in entrepreneurship because it's really teaching you how to work for somebody else for the most part. But are there some critical thinking skills I learned along the way, like problem solving stuff? I believe so. Um, but like if I knew I would end up now, would I go get an MBA for that? No, probably not. <laughs> Hey, you got a doctor in uh, real estate investing. So yeah, that's really cool. So um, you talked about earlier the impact uh, your wife had on you. I mean, what kind of impact has she had with you and uh, as a motivator for real estate investing? That's, starting yeah, out? that's a good question. This is the truth. And my wife will probably never listen to this, but, this, uh, so, <laughs> but I, I will tell the truth. There's no reason to lie. I couldn't do anything I've done without my wife. No doubt about mm -hmm. it. She really is uh, kind of the back office side, even though she, there's a bunch of stuff that she, she's effectively our CFO. You know, there's a bunch of stuff that she doesn't necessarily like to do, but she's really good at it because she used to be an investment banker and has a lot of financial background. Um, so there's a bunch of things that, that, you know, she does that I don't have to deal with, which is nice. And there's, you know, we kind of make this, we've kind of joked about this in the past. If it was just her in the business, she's very risk averse. So she probably never would have bought a single house. You just wouldn't pull the trigger. And if it was, you know, just me, I would, our financials would have been so messed up. We would have like run out of cash or whatever a long time ago and crashed and burned. And so we work really, we work really well together. It, it's not that we didn't like bump heads a lot over the mm -hmm. years, but I think we've gotten to this place of mutual respect that each other has an important role in that. And so, you know, she's certainly the person that I look to for every decision I make, everything we do. She's always the lens of, you know, does this make sense that I should be doing this or should we stop doing that? Or should we focus more on something else? And so, um, yeah, she's an important part in my life in every way and even in the business for sure. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to some of the best real estate investors out there and, you know, behind in front of the scenes, looking at the social media, they're doing it all themselves, but a lot of them have really had their wives really as a rock, their kids no motivation. So I just wanted to get a shout out to everyone's and wife. Kick, honestly, wife. and a kick in the pants too. Like I'm, pro I'm sure I'm not the only one that says that. Like there was a time where they're like, you know, they got a kick in the pants from their, from their spouse that was just like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing that? Or get out there and, you know, whatever it might be. But uh, for sure, she's been a motivator as well. Yeah, it's definitely very interesting. You know, young guys like me, you know, I, I don't have a wife, I'm not married, no girlfriend. So it's, it's interesting on my own uh, supporter, but I feel like that's something that would help me out in the future here. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and so a, a huge problem I'm having with a lot of students talking to me, you know, I, I think you've probably dealt with this before is the struggle. I got a full-time job. I'm making a lot of money wholesaling, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a push and pull. I mean, when do you think someone should with a wife and kids, you know, quit, quit their job and go full in in the real estate investing? Yeah. I mean, I think everybody has certain things that will make this answer a little different based on needs. Like, do you have kids? How important is insurance? Like things like that. But that, this is one of the things that I've seen over the years is, is, You'll I'll just give you a hypothetical example of some coaching student that's used to making fifty thousand dollars a year, and I'm like, well, what is your goal for the first year? Realistic goal? And like, well, I want to make a million bucks, and I'm like, I'm not saying that's not possible, it certainly is. But um, what happens is some people realize, well, I may not make a million bucks, and then they give up, and it's like, well, look, your first goal. This is my uh, my opinion. Your first goal in business as a wholesaler, if you're referring to wholesalers or real estate investor, should be to offset your income. Like step one is get rid of that J-O-B that's taking up your time, right? And it could be your income and the, and the additional benefits you get like insurance and things like that. Cause honestly, insurance is going to get more expensive when you're, when you're on your own versus. I know. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it's like offset that piece so that you can free up that time like everything we do in this business is a stair step right in my opinion you might be a one-man band one woman band husband wife team but you get up to a couple deals a month and it's like okay now i need to now i'm do i have enough deal flow to consider bringing on an admin and bringing on acquisitions manager when i get up to four to six deals a month then it makes sense to have two of each of those right and so there's just a series of stair steps and i think um it all starts with getting rid of you can't scale if you have, if you have a, a leash on, right? And in many ways, yeah. a job is a leash that's kind of holding you back. And it's also an excuse in many ways to say, well, I've been so busy at work, therefore my business is, is struggling. So I think for most people, that should be their first 
goal is to offset that income and free up your time from that job. Definitely, definitely. So um, I wanted to ask you this also. I know you don't have a crystal ball. You're not Nostradamus or anything like that. But uh, how would you prepare for a 2007 like recession if you were in someone's shoes? Yeah, I think uh, a couple important things are access to capital. So if you're not already, you should be trying to find ways to get financing lined up from more than one source because if that source goes away, uh, you're going to be in trouble. I, I really think that, it, I don't know if this is going to happen next week, probably not going to happen next week, but anybody that's listening right now, you should be constantly finding ways to get other sources of income, which for a lot of people in our business is rentals, right? So I won't call it passive because it's never as passive as the word passive implies. But I think, um, you know, the truth is, is a, a big portion of my net worth is on paper and it's in my rental portfolio. And so we don't pull equity out of it. In fact, we just constantly try to get it paid down. But I'm at a point now where if something were to happen to me or I had to rely on my rentals, we, we could live off of our rental property. So we choose not to do that, but it's effectively a, an insurance policy that's out there. So the more you can get those other things, uh, other sources of income lined up would be good. And I think, you know, the truth is, is even if the market shifts, no matter how little or how significant it is, um, the types of situations that we buy houses from, death, divorce, inheritance, problem tenants, all those things, they're, they're, they don't follow market cycles. Like people are not going to, those situations are not going to stop happening no matter how good or bad the market is. So those opportunities to help people solve problems with real estate will always exist. So I don't think they're going to go anywhere. It's just a matter of, it's like, what would prevent you from doing deals if there is a downturn? It's probably access to capital. It's relying on too few buyers, like cash buyers on your list to grow your list. You know, it's things like that. And so just kind of anticipate, well, if the market did tank, what are the things that would keep me from not just surviving, but how do you thrive? Like, how do you use that as an opportunity? Because truthfully, that's when most people level up their game and take off is during some sort of downturn, right? And I mean, even, even like Trump, like most of his big assets that he's bought were during downturns, just mm -hmm. kind of sit waiting patiently for a market to tank and then go, everything's on sale. So time to go shopping, right? Definitely. So I think being prepared and positioned to go take advantage of those things. Definitely, definitely. Totally agree with that. So um, where do you want to see yourself? Do you have a plan for yourself and your future for the next one, five, 10 years? Yeah, so we do. We follow the EOS process in terms of uh, business goal planning. So the entrepreneur operating system for the book traction for those that are not familiar with that. So gotcha. um, we have kind of goal planning in the business and then we back into milestones that we want to hit in the business. Personal goals, I would say, um, you know, again, I just, I like, I want to continue having an impact. I've gotten to a point now mm -hmm. to where most of what I do, I like doing, I enjoy doing it. So I'm not, it's not like I'm looking to, I'm looking forward to hitting some age and stopping doing what I'm doing. Cause I've positioned myself to mostly do what I like doing. Mm -hmm. um, I think over the years, more and more, I've positioned myself to be virtual. So a lot of what I do can be done over the phone or have access to a laptop and I'm in business. And so, um, you know, I've kind of crossed that off because we like to travel and stuff. So it's like, well, if I couldn't do that and I was had to be chained to my desk here, like that would be an issue. So at the end of the day, I, my goal is really, I don't, I don't aspire to ever kind of retire and stop doing the things that I'm doing right now. Will there be a time when that winds down? Probably, but uh, I'm 45 years old. So no, no, no end in sight for me at this point. <laughs> oh, definitely. So um, I want to give you a quick lightning round of just four really quick questions. I don't want to put you on the spot here, but what is your number one source of all these things? So what is your number one source of marketing you would say for someone? For single family? Yes. Direct mail, no doubt. Okay. And if someone is looking for a multifamily? Uh, so I'm in a structure now where people are bringing deals to us. So we kind of rely mm. on, I guess, kind of bird dogs are finding deals that's how it's been so far but uh, that might change in the future i think that's more of just cold calling and building relationships with brokers okay. and what would your number one tip be to find cash buyers to find cash buyers for a buyer's list yes uh so the best thing you can do is actually have something for sale um, <laughs> and so i think what happens is a lot of investors when they have a house for sale that they want to wholesale somebody comes in super fast they like sell it and they're done 
you got to use that opportunity to build up your list a little bit. So have like an open house or a showing or have a bunch of people inquire about it and make sure you don't take the best offer for a couple of days. I know I'm killing myself by saying that, but you should uh, let a bunch of people come to you and those are the real buyers. So it's real easy to post something on Facebook and say, I want to build my buyers list, shoot me your email address and get hundreds of emails. But the truth is, is most of those people are never going to do a deal. They just are dreamers. Definitely. Totally agree with that. Um, what's the number one thing you can tell someone instantly to help them with their acquisitions skills? Prop, so I'll say two things. One is if you're not good at acquisitions and you, you hate the idea of it. I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago. He's a good guy. He's got a good business. And he's been pulling way back on his advertising and kind of unfold things a little bit. It's because he really hates the acquisitions role and he's doing it himself. So I think we're kind of, you know, we're all taught in this business to not taught or learned somehow this learned behavior of being frugal. I'll just do it myself and, and all that. And so what happens is if you're, if you're not a salesperson, if you don't like sitting at the kitchen table and talking to people or talking to sellers and solving their problem, then you're costing your business money by putting yourself in that position. So you need to find somebody else to do that in your business. Other than that, I would say, don't make it about the house. An early lesson for me is I was out, I was trying to buy houses. I have to get a deal. I have to get a deal. That's how I felt. And it took a realization of going through that a bunch of times to realize like, if I can't solve that people, that person's problem, then I can't win. And so kind of leading from how do I solve their problem? instead of how do I get the house? If I solve enough problems, I'll get some houses, right? And so it's really trying to put the person first, the seller first, help them out. Sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll just sleep better at night because you help people even if you, even if you didn't get the house. So put, put the seller first. Definitely, I, I think you've said this answer before, but um, correct me if I'm wrong or this has changed, uh, but what is the number one book you would say someone should read when they're looking to start real estate investing? Um, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, there's, a, there's so many great books out there. Yeah. I, I would say if you haven't read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it helps you understand the importance of shifting from that employee mindset. Yes. So that's a critical one because I just think until you kind of see the cash flow matrix of like, I'm an employee, and truthfully, there's a lot of people that say they're a business owner, but they're just self-employed. They, they, the job owns them, right? And so they're really self-employed. And, and if, until you understand the importance of moving from an employee to self-employed to a business owner to ultimately a true investor where you do nothing and your money just works for you, that really will be eye-opening if people haven't read that yet. Definitely. I love Robert Kiyosaki. The only problem I have with him, he's been saying there's been a crash for like six years. Oh, yeah. He's definitely, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, with the mindset with money for young people, he's amazing. But that's the only uh, issue I have with him. And what is the number one book that had the biggest impact on your life and the mindset that you had? A number one book I should, this is crazy. I read so much and now I'm like, <laughs> you know, put on the spot. I hate to put, I hate to put you on the spot, but just, no, for I would say there's a lot of great books out there. I would say um, anything. The truth is, is anything that's kind of mindset related. Cause a lot of us, honestly, a lot of people that fail, they beat themselves, you know, the, it's not that real estate won and they lost or anything like that. It's usually they defeated themselves by, uh, you know, having these self-limiting beliefs on, is this possible? Can you really do this? Uh, can you really scale it? I mean, there's people that are like, do a deal, like you said, make a hundred grand or whatever. And they're like, well, I've got lucky. I don't know if that'll happen again. It's like, why would you even tell yourself that? Right. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins, listen to a lot of Tony Robbins stuff. I just Great. think, I just think kind of mindset wise, mm -hmm. um, it's critical that you understand what your goals are and chart a path to get there and don't give up. Definitely, definitely. So the two cool Tony Robbins books, if you guys want to hear it, is I'm pretty sure it's Unleash the Power Within. That's one of his first, Awaken the Giant Within. And then he has yep. another one called Unshakable about money. Um, that's a cool book. So I'd like to end this with the same question I ask every single person. So if you were a 17 year old kid living in Dallas, Texas with no money, but with the same knowledge you have now, what would you do to get your first deal? I think you should go work for somebody else that is doing what you want to do. Hmm. Right. If money is the problem. Now, if you, if you feel like you're capable, the thing is, is you might be able to go make a deal happen, but until you work for somebody and you see the systems and processes and start to understand 
how a real business works, you're going to have to go figure that all out on your own. So I would go, it's like an internship, right? Go emulate yeah. somebody else, go find out the inner workings. And, uh, you know, I think early on, I was always worried about like, well, what if I teach somebody and then they go compete against me? This is a big market. And a lot of <laughs> markets that we're in are huge. Like the average person is not going to do that, but it's like, well, is there a way to say, Hey, let me teach you how to do this. You're going to do it for me for a while. And then eventually here's how we can partner together. Um, by you going out on your own, but I can still add value to you. I'll still get some benefit and it'll be a win-win for everybody. So I, I think a lot more about collaboration now. So I think, look, at the end of the day, you could, if you're 17 years old, you can choose to go pay $100,000 or more to go to college, right? You could easily spend a quarter million dollars if you wanted to by yeah. going to private school. Or you can go work for free or you know, cheap um, just to get that experience. And the great thing about real estate investing, I believe, is it's it's really if you do it right if you are spending money on advertising generating leads you have operations of how do you do when what do you do when you get a deal what's the process you go through it's very much fundamental small business and so once you learn those fundamentals it's very transferable there's a lot of skills you learn in college that are honestly just not transferable if you get a bs degree in something and nobody wants it that's not going to help you anywhere you go but the types of things that we do every day in our business you could, if, if I wanted to get into the HVAC business right now, which I have no interest in doing that, I could probably just crush it because of the skill sets that I've had to learn over the last 12 years are the same for most small businesses. Find customers and leads, um, serve them well, have an operation, uh, systems and processes operation that allows me to fulfill those customers and make money doing it and rinse and repeat over and over and over again. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I got, I got my BBA and what, like, two semesters ago and I was doing all over. I, I went there and then I left because I was cold calling my dorm, came back home, did my real estate investing. I mean, the only thing I learned there is to love college football and that's basically it. <laughs> I don't think I've used it at all. Yeah. So. Well, there's nothing wrong with going to college. I, I've actually had that question a little bit because I have a couple of nephews that are, you know, one just graduated from high school and one that's coming up. And like my family, I've kind of sent these messages to my family of like, I don't think you should go to college. I, I don't actually believe that. I don't think if you don't know what you want to do, you shouldn't go waste the money. If you have money to go to college, uh, I think it's a great place to learn about how to be on your own and things like that. But I don't think anybody should go get some BS degree that's not, that's impossible to get a job from, right? Yeah, great. So um, any party thoughts before we uh, sign off the podcast? You know, I'll just say, I think at this, at this point where we are here, uh, early 2020, that sounds really weird saying that, but early 2020, is that a lot of people question what's gonna happen in the marketplace. We talked about it a little bit, right? And nobody has a crystal ball. Honestly, I thought I had a little bit of a crystal ball. I thought I was like put on my economist hat and I'm gonna to talk to some of my other smart buddies about it. Like four or five years ago, we're like, oh, probably in the next 12 to 18 months, you know, it never happened. So is there gonna be a downturn at some point? There are always market cycles, but I think um, the best of the best learn how to ride those market cycles and how to thrive during those periods and how to prepare for them. So you don't, you don't sit around and say, well, I'm going to wait till after the market crashes and then I'll get started. Like who knows when it'll crash, who knows if it'll crash, um, how severe that will be. So there's honestly the best time to get started is now you just have to be aware of where you are in the market cycle and how to play the game differently when it changes. Definitely. I think the only thing you forgot to add when you were 17 is they probably should have listened to the investor fuel, uh, podcast. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, Guys, so how do people get a hold of you and hold of Flip Nerd and your podcast or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, if you go to flipnerd.com, uh, you can get access to all of our shows. I have a couple different podcasts. We've done about 1,500 video podcasts over the last wow. uh, six and a half years. A few different brands and stuff. Right now, I have the Investor, uh, the Flip Nerd podcast. We have an Investor Fuel podcast where I interview members of my mastermind. And uh, so, you know, find... Uh, we have a flip nerd group on uh, Facebook. That's a public group. And um, I'm pretty active on social media, Instagram and Facebook. So you can find me there, Mike Hambright. Uh, other than that, flipnerd.com, investorfuel.com is our mastermind. And then uh, the investor machine is our kind of done for you lead generation service where we focus on really heavily on using data to generate the best leads through mail and, uh, and uh, data for skip tracing. Perfect. So I really appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Um, Thanks for the opportunity. No problem. So I'll see you guys in two weeks. Signing out. Bye.